you look at the slide bef before you, you see um, the last four years of green bond growth. And if you look at the tranche for municip municipal debt, that includes U.S. and international issuers, cities, um, public utilities, other public entities entering this market. You can see it's um, had a very robust year last year after a very, very sm small year of 2013, and we're seeing a lot of robustness this year. Uh, Climate Bonds Initiative expects, um, it was predicted 3x three, three growth last year. Last year there was a $37 billion global market, including corporates and unions in all classes. And um, this year we think it'll be at least double that, not triple, but still double. So if you look at the issuer types um, in, this, in, this, in this pie chart, today it's been mostly corporate issuers. Um, development banks really pioneered this, uh, this sector in starting the World Bank in 2007. And you're seeing a growing segment of muni, provincial, and city debt um, increasing the, the, the share of the pie. What, what are the benefits that we know about from this market so far? We know that there's diversification of investors. We know that also investors who, new investors who invest once come back with what we call stickiness. We're seeing longer tenors in the market, and we're also seeing the ability to group multiple, quote unquote, green assets in a single issuance to get to scale. So why are we so excited about this opportunity? It's really because there's so much demand out there. Um, institutional investors are driving this market. They're driven by a combination of mandates to invest in, in better assets, but also a dawning realization that their portfolios are exposed to climate change risk. So evidence of that demand is, is out there um, in the form of commitments. Um, 24 trillion of investors um, in last year's climate summit uh, committed to investing in, in this market. Also um, calling for swift action by governments to increase this market. A separate group of investors worth 19 trillion um, also committed publicly um, to scale up their climate-related investments over the next um, 10 years by a factor of by a factor of 10 over the next five years, and we see really an issuance is actual evidence of this growth. We see oversubscription in the green muni market. The DC water bonds, an example. We see upsizing of issuances. We see, um, as I mentioned earlier, public commitments, um, and we see mandates from investors to invest in this space. So we really think this is an opportunity for, for cities to get involved in a growing market and also improve life in cities by, by increasing um, the, the effectiveness of infrastructure. These sectors um, which are covered by this, usual suspects infrastructure, also we're seeing some growth in agriculture, um, supply chain, and forestry. Next slide, please. So U.S. cities uh, really face a critical crisis. It's, it's both an infrastructure crisis and a climate crisis, and green bonds really provide solutions to both um, as a way of financing sustainable infrastructure with, with, with diversified pools of capital. So we know that there's 3.6 trillion of need by 2020, not being met in basic need. There's a massive amount of weather, weather damages occurring in, in, uh, in metro areas, uh, partly attributable to climate change. Of course, most carbon emissions are so in some way connected to cities, whether through buildings or through power plants or through other sources, transportation. And of course, we know that infrastructure, um, the degradation causes productivity reductions and also worsens the quality of life. But in order to get the, the right investments in infrastructure that's sustainable and green, we have to have standards, and that's what the green bonds market brings to the table. Next slide, please. I'm going to actually skip this slide. This just talks about the U.S. mini market. You guys are all in the market, so you know how it works. Um, next slide, please. So what we've seen so far in green unis in the U.S. are all kinds of bonds except project bonds. We've seen, we've seen geo bonds, revenue bonds, securitizations in Hawaii. Um, next slide, please. So how to issue a green uni bond. Uh, this is a simplified version. The, the Green Muni Bonds Playbook being released today as part of this discussion. Um, we'll have a detailed guidance about how to, um, how to use this process, how to, looking at a couple of case studies about how it's been used, and documenting the benefits and the growth of the market in a more detailed way. And it's, it's sort of the first platform of how we're trying to build a, a learning network and a community of practice around, the green, around green bonds in the U.S. Uh, to be part of the larger international network. So you can just see briefly 
Um, if you're a state a utility, a city department, a transit agency, et cetera, you identify your projects, your capital program, and you run that program through a, essentially a green screen, isolating the green projects, and then you collect those projects um, to form a bond issuance, and there's various ways to enhance the marketability of your bonds by bringing in third-party um, verification or certification. The Climate Bonds Initiative provides certification, which is the opportunity to have your the assets um, benchmarked against a standard. Other systems rely on um, looking at the issuer's own criteria and having a, having a second party come in and evaluate those. There's also very influential green bonds principles, which are which are put out by the major underwriter banks. They're being constantly, continually revised which uh, really focus on transparency and process and allow investors to decide how green um, they want their bond to be. Next slide, please. So what is the Green City Bonds Coalition's mission? Uh, it's threefold. It's really to advance the discussion. We're going to pro be providing information on investor requirements um, to increase communication between investors and cities. Um, looking at how do you know what's green, the green asset class standards, and how to do uh, how, to, how to do an issuance um, how, how to guide. Uh, looking to increase liquidity in the market, working with cities underwriters and other market participants to grow the issuances. To, to, for this market really to grow, it needs to have liquidity. Um, and, the, and the beauty of the market, as I would have mentioned earlier, had I had a little bit more time, is that there's really nothing special about a green bond other than it's segregated and assets are applied, or, 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 or the assets are, must be green assets. All the credit characteristics of the bond um, are the same, so it's very easy for an investor to slot this asset in as a way to satisfy um, its either its imperative uh, ESG imperative or to diversify away into, into different kinds of low carbon or resilient assets. So um, again, I mentioned earlier we're going to try we're going to build this issuer network. Um, we think peer learning is really critical to this working, and that's why we've invited. Um, some of your colleagues um, to speak here today about their experiences with the green bonds. Next slide, please. So um, today's speakers um, that, that I was alluding to just a minute ago are um, Barbara Whitehorn, who is CFO of Asheville, Mark Kim, CFO of DC Water, Jackie Dingfelder, Senior Policy Director and Senior Policy Director, and Jonas Beery, Debt Manager, each of the City of Portland and Mike Brown, Capital Finance Analyst at San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. So we're going to turn it over to each speaker to talk for about three minutes, and um, we'll be, after that we'll be turning to some questions from the coalition and questions from the audience. Thank you. Barbara, take it away. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm Barbara Whitehorn. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the City of Asheville, North Carolina. And we recently did the first green bond issue in North Carolina, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, ours was a fairly simple process. We actually had a, a bond, um, our bond attorney told us, you know, hey, you're refunding these water system bonds. They were all created to save water and to do uh, better transmission and delivery, all these things that are really critical. And he said, there's not really any reason you couldn't classify these as green. So we went and kind of looked at the criteria and said, you're right, we can do this. I, I think the most challenging thing is actually the reporting for us. Is we, we're committed to reporting on our website, you know, what we've done with this, you know, granted it's refunding, but basically the projects that we did with the 2005 and 2007 revenue bonds. And we did a lot of things. We did some new valve work, we fixed a dam, we've we've done a lot of things to really improve our water delivery because we have a high water loss. If any of you have been to Asheville, you're probably familiar with the terrain, which is very mountainous, and we lose a lot of water because we have to keep the water pressure extremely high to get up the mountains. Um, so the green the green bonds were a great almost marketing for the city from my perspective. You know, Asheville sees itself as very progressive and, you know, really like always leading the way in some of these things. So being able to say, hey, we've got green bonds out there was a big deal. And the process for us was exactly the same as issuing other bonds. 
So I'll stop there so that I don't run over my three minutes. Thank you so much, Barbara. We'll be we'll have questions later after we get through all the speakers. Yeah, this is Jackie Dingfelder with the City of Portland. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Well, we figured it out. It was not very intuitive. So, uh, and thank you for having a, a picture of our lovely city up there. Uh, <laughs> I realized we didn't send you a PowerPoint. So, uh, so I'm here with Jonas Beery, who is our debt manager for the city, and the two of us worked on our uh, green bond resolution that was recently adopted by city council. Uh, and uh, so I will just go walk through a little bit of the background and then uh, Jonas will be here to answer any questions during the question and answer period. So the city has a history of environmental and financial policy leadership and as I mentioned we adopted our green bond resolution <clears throat> along with our updated climate action plan on June 24th, so just a few weeks ago. It did pass the city council unanimously and just wanted to share some key points that are unique about Portland's approach. Uh, our city is a AAA rated city and we work hard to maintain that rating and minimize risk. So that certainly was an issue when we were developing our strategy. So we needed to be very uh, mindful of that. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we're going to benefit uh, from the lowest possible cost of borrowing. But that means we can't always benefit from new financial tools in the same way as issuers that have fewer low-cost options. So the city was very interested in, in pursuing green bonds. The resolution that we just passed directs our uh, financial folks, mainly our, our debt manager, to work with issuers and also make sure that uh, uh, our projects are clearly defined. And that was a big part of uh, the message that the council sent to city staff. We wanted to make sure that uh, the, the city's infrastructure bureaus develop a top shelf framework that will guide future issuance. So what we learned to date, and uh, this is from conversations we've been having with bankers and potential investors, advisors, and other market participants, that, that as one of the speakers said, you know, we want to make sure we're concerned about credibility, that uh, when we are talking about a green project, it truly is a green project. And also, we want to make sure to uh, limit administrative costs and regulatory risks. We aim to include only projects that already have clearly reportable outcomes, as we know that reporting will be a challenge. We also are working closely with our infrastructure bureaus, water, sewer, parks, transportation to help identify project eligibility. And we want to make sure that these projects that are financed by green bonds are actually completed as envisioned at the time of the bond issuance, that we don't experience changes in scope that, com that could compromise the project timing or green eligibility. And it's especially important for our infrastructure bureaus, which sometimes borrow for their entire 18 to 24 month capital improvement uh, uh, pr project timeframe. And that could have uh, uh, an impact on the project. We can't have a changing scope of the project. So we don't want to issue green bonds that end up financing eligible projects. Also, we believe that in the green bond market, we, we don't want to oversaturate with projects that aren't well suited. And by developing clear guidelines, we believe that we're, we're more likely to receive the best market reception. Uh, in closing, the next steps for the city is we're working with our uh, infrastructure bureaus to develop a green bond uh, financial framework so we have clear definition of what the pro those projects are. We will receive sign-off from the financial managers, the infrastructure bureaus, and elected officials, and then we'll start uh, reviewing our specific capital projects for eligibility and issuance. So with that, I will stop there and happy to, to answer questions during the the question period. Thank you so much, Jackie. Well, let me just quickly give a quick view of, of DC because DC is one of the case studies in the, in the green, green Muni Bonds uh, playbook. You probably heard about this, this issue. It was a century bond, 100 year bond, um, initially sized at 300 million, um, up to 50 million on the day of the issuance due to pent-up demand. Um, 
the yield settled at lower than the expected spread at 4.814%. Um, it was, it was AA2 from Moody's, AA plus from S&P, AA, AA from Fitch. And Goldman Sachs was the underwriter. Unlike the, many other, most other muni um, issuances, green muni issuances in the U.S., D.C. Water decided to get a second opinion from a group called Vigio about the green credentials of the, of the bond. And uh, the proceeds were used for completing stormwater and sewage infrastructure to reduce um, combined sewage overflows uh, through uh, essentially a pipe, a pipe and tunnel system. So um, I think we interviewed Mark and his team, and, um, and a big question is the cost of the cost of actually um, reporting, and also the cost of setting up the, the tracking system, and the cost of a second opinion. So I, I can't speak for them, but, I, but the general feedback we got from DC Water was that the cost of the consultants to do the, the green analysis was comparable to other consultants. And at, the, and at the size of their issuance, it was not a material cost um, to their, you know, a material cost to the overall transaction. Um, the, they feel very strongly about the market going towards second, second opinions or standards because uh, what Mark likes to say is you can't imagine going to the market with unaudited financials, and ultimately, over time, this market will, go, will demand the same thing um, from, from about regarding green performance. Um, the, the process of working with Vigio to do due diligence, um, they didn't find excessively burdensome, and the reporting, uh, the ongoing reporting that they're doing Probably because it's, a, it's basically a single asset deal is not very burdensome. They've actually um, put on their re released their initial reporting uh, for the first year on their website, and we could actually could circulate that if that's of interest to folks after this call to see. Um, they're also looking at going back in the market um, 2015. I think in the end of the end of this year with another green bond, given the success that they had on the initial green bond, um, they, they they saw uh, diversification that they hadn't seen. Previously, from the SRI investors, socially responsible investor class, that they would not have um, bought the bonds if not for the green credentials. And it was very important that the marketing process with the underwriters um, really spend a lot of time with those investors and figure out what, what they wanted, which really resulted in the, um, the $1.1 billion in orders initially and lowering of the spread by 15 basis points. So why the bottom spread is lower, you know, is always obviously of some conjecture, but the evidence is that part of the factor certainly was the green credentials and the time DC took to really put together a deal with the market wanted. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Um, I think uh, it's just safe to assume that um, uh, DC and, and San Francisco might not be able to, to join this um, part of the discussion, Doug. Okay. So let's move on. We have a few questions that we're going to open, we'll open up the Q&A um, pretty shortly, but we have a few questions that the coalition members are, are going to ask to the, to the city presenters, and um, we're, going to, we're going to ask people to limit their answers to if we have fewer speakers, so maybe we'll, we'll make it, um, you know, a minute and a half, two minutes max. So I'm going to ask um, James Alexander of the C40 to ask the first question. Uh, th thank you so much, Doug, and thanks uh, for, for, for moderating, and thanks to the cities for presenting. This was uh, really fantastic. I'm James Alexander. I head up the finance initiative at C40, and we're one of the partners in the Green City Bonds Coalition. Um, my question to the panel, um, and thank you for coming on and, and, and asking and answering questions, is what, what do you see as the additional benefits and the underlying benefits of issuing green bonds? Why, why have you chosen to go down the green bond route, and what, what perhaps political benefits do you think there are, or um, for obviously financial benefits, but also what, what, what might be the longer-term benefits to your cities of issuing green bonds? I can speak to that. This is Barbara Whitehorn. Great. Uh, Thanks, 
for for Asheville, I think the biggest part of issuing green bonds right now, because there was no cost savings, we didn't see anything particularly different on the on the side of issuing the actual debt itself. Ours was very much political, kind of getting that capital with the green sort of exciting idea. I mean, our council is very, our city council is very into being ahead of the curve with environmental stuff. And we're a little limited. We only have a water system. We don't have a sewer system. We don't own our landfill and we don't own our electric company. So there aren't a lot of opportunities to really commit to being green. And I think politically this for them was a huge win. So that that was probably the biggest the biggest piece from my perspective. Barbara, what was the most you talked touched on within this already? I think you mentioned reporting earlier on in your initial comments. But what was the most what is or was the most challenging part of the process? And I'll add to that. And if it's reporting, do you think it'll get easier over time with the second issuance, or is it, is it a startup cost, or is it something you feel will always be a hurdle going forward when you decide to package assets in this way? I think actually the reporting is probably going to become more complex. Um, this was a very easy one as far as, you know, kind of an easy win for green bonds for us because we knew that all of the underlying projects of the debt were all to do with water conservation and improved transmission. So there really, there really wasn't a lot to put together as far as the reporting that we're going to have to do, and most of the projects are complete at this point. Um, we do want to make sure that people can see on our website, you know, what we've done, and we're trying to develop a page on our city website where you can actually go and see what are the green bonds we've issued, what are the projects that are complete, what are we looking at issuing. Um, so I guess we're going to complicate it ourselves a little bit. Um, because we could just simply have an update of, you know, here's the projects that are done, here are the bonds they're related to. But I think it's really important as uh, as leaders in, in green bonds, because anyone who's into them right now really is a leader in this in this market, I think we have to commit to do a little more than the minimum. So we want to make it something that – we're really showing people what we're doing with their money if they're investing in our green bonds. So that's really – that's what I think about reporting long term. As far as the most difficult thing in the actual process, and I, I didn't mention this originally, but it was it was going back um, – my, my staff did this. So of course, I forgot about it. So um, they went back and went through each project and made sure that we were not – going to classify anything as green that absolutely wasn't green. There, We wanted to make sure that there was nothing that we were doing that we could later go back and go, oh, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't really in the spirit of what we were trying to do. So that was the biggest challenge. But I think we, we were really successful. It didn't take a terribly long time. And I look forward to having another green bond issue, even though I think it's going to be a lot more challenging next time. And, and this is um, Jackie and Jonas. We were booted off and we got back on. So can you hear us now? Yes, thank you. Are you fine? Right. Thanks for persisting. So, okay, so going back to the previous question, uh, just uh, quickly, um, we'd asked um, any additional underlying benefits. Hello? Jackie, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Um, in addition to the, to, the, to the sort of the green criteria and the market access, what are the additional and underlying benefits of, of using this instrument that you've experienced or, or, or expect to experience going forward? I guess you haven't actually done an issuance yet, but you're, you're getting ready to. Is that, is that right? What do you, what do you expect yeah, to get out? This, this is Jonas Beery, the city of Portland debt manager. And, and yeah, we um, – I mean, we've been engaged in this discussion for quite a few months. We're sort of in a position where we don't have a capital project coming up, so it's been a little bit fortunate in that it's given us time to really do our due diligence and develop a framework. I know a couple of people have mentioned sort of credibility, and, and that's what we've heard is that it's really all about credibility. Um, we've heard from sort of some local investors who have interest in um, 
you know, SRI investment and particularly green investment. And so that's been, uh, I think, a benefit in starting to build relationships with local participants who maybe haven't historically participated uh, in our in our bond sales. Um, I think Barbara mentioned earlier marketing. I mean, that's that's been, I think, another sort of side advantage is um, we've historically had a kind of a solid reputation in environmental issues, and so being able to participate with a green bond uh, helps helps expand that. Uh, from my perspective, finance perspective, obviously we want uh, to reduce our borrowing costs. Uh, I think there's some potential that as borrowing costs, if, if they're proven to be reduced, that could actually facilitate um, additional issuance and maybe reprioritization of, of green projects. Um, as Barbara was just saying, though, uh, we think it's really important to have a, I've kind of referred to it as top shelf um, strategy where we want to really have the best bonds, the best credibility. Um, that may mean actually limiting issuance to some degree because we, we want to make sure we're really targeting the investors that are the most likely to have true uh, mission-driven uh, investment profiles and, and maybe give us that, that slight uptick in pricing. That's, that's great. That, that's very helpful. Um, the next question we, were, we would have asked you what was, was also this backwards looking, what was the most challenging part of the process, but I guess that you're, you're in the process now, um, any, was there any, any, any part of which, which is especially challenging, uh, putting together your program and your standards? Uh, sure. So, so yeah, we're, we're kind of uh, working our way through a lot of those challenging issues, but a couple of things that obviously we've identified are, are just the market expectations and kind of synthesizing very different perspectives. Uh, some investors who said, you know, we really just want to see when we get our bond report that uh, it says green in the title. We've talked to others who, who really are the true mission driven. Uh, those are really the, the uh, investors that I think we're looking to target. Um, and then the other thing we're, we're kind of working through is um, and, uh, project identification. We're on the front edge of, of that, and how are we going to really um, uh, draw the line on what projects qualify and what don't. We're, we're just starting that discussion with our uh, infrastructure bureaus, as Jackie mentioned. Uh, the other challenge that we're trying to get a, a solution to is, is the third-party verification question. Uh, I, I personally feel like that's probably pretty important given the concerns about credibility that we've heard. I'm not particularly motivated to try to say every time we go out and do a new issuance, let's have uh, another fee paid to an independent third party. So we're trying to entertain discussions about whether we can, if we develop this sort of tight, solid framework by which we will um, uh, determine project eligibility and, and things like ring fencing of proceeds and uh, reporting, uh, can we get certification on that framework? and get sort of a one-time certification. I've heard from uh, at least one provider that that's been um, offered to um, some corporate issuers, but maybe not yet to a, a U.S. Muni issuer. So um, still TBD, but that's kind of the pathway we're hoping to meet uh, that certification challenge with. Great. Thank you. Um, Katie, did you want to ask the next questions? Yeah, um, uh, thank you. Thank you both for, for kind of giving us these comments. I mean, how do you, what are your intentions and what are your thoughts around actually tracking, you know, keeping, keeping track of performance over time? Um, what are the mechanisms that, that you, you know, intend to use or are thinking about using or what, what still needs to be done for, for tracking? And let me just say, let's, let's sort of keep this pretty short. We're going to try to give 10 yeah. minutes of, of, of time for folks to ask um, for the rest of it from the call. Yeah. So Barbara and then uh, J Jonas and Jackie. So when you're saying tracking, are you wanting talking about the bond performance? Oh, sorry, the, your environmental projects performance. Uh, okay, because I'm you. like, that's kind of different. Um, yes. <laughs> I think that's part of what we're really trying to do with the website, is we want to have a whole piece of our website that will be dedicated to our environmental projects and, and what we're doing to sort of green Asheville. So complicated and hard, and it'll be very fun and good, too. So that's my short answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, I may be able to top that short answer. Um, and to some degree, we don't know. I mean, we certainly track some uh, project outcomes of something on our radar is LED streetlight replacement. Well, that's going to have some pretty clearly and easily reportable outcomes. But as we look at things like water infrastructure, uh, where we may be carving out just a piece of the CIP, um, certainly there's going to be some benefits to that. But, but that's a, a challenge that we need to work through as we mm -hmm. work with the bureaus over the next uh, few months. Great. Thanks, Jonas. Um, I'm going to, I want to ask Peter Ellsworth from Ceres to ask the next question. I just wanted to sort of pick up on um, a, a, 
sort of an, an answer that that was uh, that that was flirted with a little bit. Um, what what have you guys learned as you've as you've encountered investors and sort of in in the context of a if if you were to issue a a green bond um, again or maybe if another city were to come to you and and ask your advice and and they hadn't yet. Um, uh, done a consultation with investors or gone on a road show. Um, what have you learned? Wow, um, this is Barbara again. I don't, we didn't come into this from a, you know, big planned perspective. Ours was very off the cuff. Our bond council said, hey, this looks like this would be a good thing for you guys to do, and, and you're Asheville. You should do it. Um, so it was literally that simple for us. And I know that sounds – that's, like, so not the answer you need. You actually need some guidance there, but that's that's what we did. Uh, yeah, this is Jonas at the city. Um, so obviously we haven't issued, but but we've started engaging in, in conversations with investors so that we can uh, kind of point ourselves in the right direction, I guess. A couple of points I'd make is the feedback that I've received is – um, uh, very enthusiastic, uh, but that's also tempered by, I mean, I've frankly had investors say, yeah, we, we'd really like the city to issue green bonds, but but no, we're really not going to pay you anything different. And so that's been a little bit disconcerting, although I think as the market develops, that relationship's going to start to change. Um, we also typically issue our bonds through a competitive sale process where we just get bids on the morning of sale. Uh, that often means there isn't a lot of pre-marketing. Jackie mentioned earlier our sort of strong bond rating, so we get some advantages there. Uh, as we go out and do a green bond issuance, we're going to want to do some additional pre-marketing and additional communication. Uh, so we're going to have to develop uh, a plan to reach out to investors and, and really take those extra steps pre-issuance uh, to, to get the right right eyes on our on our bond sale. Thank you. Sh Sean Kidney, are you on? Um, Doug, I don't think that Sean is on. I think that um, I'm going to change up a little bit. I know you wanted to open up to questions, and um, given some of the um, the fact that there's not a, a hand raising option, um, I, I have some questions that came through um, that I can through the chat function, which seems to be working well, so I can talk through those. Great. Okay, great. So um, we we have a, a question. Um, uh, around sort of the uh, additionality, additionality benefits, so kind of better understanding, you know, in your municipalities whether the green bond program is actually going to increase or will, you know, is or, or will be increasing capital allocation to environmental environmental projects. Um, and then just also understanding around uh, the prices of green bonds, whether they're higher, you know, than the conventional bonds. Okay, this is Barbara. Um, we won't be increasing our amount of environmental um, bond issues. I think what this is making us focus on is how we can take what we're already doing and look at it from a different perspective. And if that means we change something in the structure of a project we're doing to make it more environmentally friendly and more green, that's likely. But I don't think it's going to change the focus of our capital improvement program all around. And then you had another part of that question, and I don't remember what it was. Um, I think it was just around questions of cost. Um, oh, we didn't see any price difference. We did a competitive, um, our, our bonds sold on the competitive market, and there was absolutely no difference. And actually, when I was talking to a the Wall Street Journal about it, and one of the kind of disappointing things right now in the green muni market is that there doesn't seem to be a price differential. So it's not it's not like you get anything really out of it at this point, other than just sort of the satisfaction of having issued green bonds and knowing that um, investors with um, very specific mission-driven goals are wanting to invest in your bonds. At least that's what I'm seeing right now. I had this quickly. I think what Sean, the data I've heard from Sean is that um, there is, and this isn't, isn't limited to U.S. data, that there, there is some inconsistent, very small um, basis point differentials on green bonds when, you, when you've had the opportunity to really 
um, see contemporaneous issuances and how they how they do in the market. There's definitely oversubscription, which indicates that there could be some pricing effects. So there's some there's something, but it's it's definitely not systematic. I think what we're seeing in the market. Yeah. Yeah, th this is Jonas. I might add to that the pricing discussion. Um, yeah, certainly seeing that there's inconsistent um, results, and it's very difficult, I think, to assess when you're comparing different securities because a basis point or two change uh, may be due to other factors beyond just the green designation. But what I can say is that there's just pretty clear evidence from what I've seen that green bonds are getting additional participation, additional oversubscription, and bringing uh, buyers into the mix that haven't been there before. Uh, so while I agree with Barbara that we may not actually see um, a, a material difference in the pricing initially, uh, A, we're bringing some new investors into the fold that haven't participated before, and that's going to have some incremental benefits at minimum. Uh, also, we look at it as an opportunity to really build those new relationships uh, as we start to look at issuance you know, in 2017, 2018, and in the future uh, that we're starting now building those invest uh, relationships with, with green and, and SRI investors so that we can potentially get that benefit down the road. Um, great. And another question sort of on that line around benefits and, and understanding those. So there's a question around whether you can speak about adaptation projects that mitigate risks um, and thinking about, you know, the work that you're doing and um, sort of the question is how do you demonstrate and report on benefits when they're not necessarily quantifiable because of, um, you know, risk avoided? You know, I, I don't know. I don't think that's one that I can answer right now. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and I think that that's, I mean, it's one of the challenges that we have here is figuring out how are we going to report on outcomes, particularly in circumstances where they're not abundantly clear. Uh, I think our initial approach is likely to, to be that if there isn't currently a clear reporting structure uh, and one that's sort of meaningful and useful, for us, that project may not meet the, the minimum bar to qualify for green bond issuance, but certainly we want to look at those uh, as we develop projects in the future and develop the, the CIP. Uh, one other thing I'll mention about additionality uh, that, that came up, a question that came up earlier is we've actually gotten a little bit of pushback from the Bureau saying, hey, wait a minute, you're not going to come in as a finance guy now and tell us how to change our, our CIP. And, and we've taken a similar approach in saying, no, up front, initially, let's just look at what's already in your CIP. Uh, but I go back to the point uh, I made earlier that if we can start to demonstrate uh, a financial yeah. benefit, that's going to naturally move uh, uh, additive projects into the future CIP development process. Great. Um, Doug, do you think we have one, time for one more question? Sure. Yeah, one more. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so uh, sort of a little bit different, but um, so a lot of cities, municipalities are being actively lobbied, um, you know, by, by residents and different groups to divest from non-renewable energy sector and to pay a premium for purchasing from renewable sources and distributors. Um, and do you see green city bonds in your work in this space, kind of that investment strategy fitting into this, you know, larger kind of uh, movement around financial management? So, so this is Jackie from the City of Portland, and I can answer that because we're dealing with that right now. Uh, as I mentioned, as part of our Climate Action Plan, uh, which I'm happy to send the link to anybody that would like to see, see it, but we uh, listed a, a series of policy action items, and one of them was divesting in fossil fuels moving forward. The other was developing a fossil fuel export policy. So both of those uh, were part of the Climate Action Plan, which was adopted the same time as our green bond resolution. So to answer your question, yes, you know, we've been, cities throughout the United States has been, uh, I would say, lobbied heavily by citizen groups. Uh, there's an organization called 350 Org that's been rallying around this issue in particular. And so they've been uh, meeting with city commissioners and urging them to, to divest. And then the second is especially cities that are on, uh, that have seaports. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of what's happening up in Seattle. There's been demonstrations about ships that have been coming in uh, around fossil fuel exports. So they're, they're linked, uh, and yes, there has been pressure to do that. As far as renewables, our state has a renewable portfolio standard, so our investor-owned utilities, our private utilities, are already required 
to invest 25% in renewable energy by 2025. Here at the City of Portland, we're at 100% renewable energy. Uh, a big chunk of that is through RECs, uh, which uh, as I'm sure you know, that's not that we're, we're directly generating that renewable energy, but we're purchasing it through the market. But we are also trying to increase our own generation of renewables. And so that's a big uh, priority for our mayor as well. Great, I think, uh, if you want to say something quick, quickly um, to wrap up that question, we could do that or we can just move to next steps. Um, Barbara, do you want to say something about that? Um, no, I think I think she covered it very well. My city has not yet really gotten into our own portfolio management as far as having specific, you know, rules for what we can invest in, and we're trying to not do that yet. I don't think we're quite sophisticated enough to do that. We don't have the staff, um, but I'm hoping to get there at some point so that our council can feel good about that too. But I'm going to have to I'm going to have to get off yeah. because I've got a okay. meeting at one. Thank but you thank so you much. All very much. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. So that's 30 seconds. What are the next steps? Um, this is the first of a series of events we're going to be hosting around this topic. We're releasing the playbook, and all the folks who are um, part of the coalition are available for, for outreach and assistance for any of the folks on the call. Um, and those emails should be in the slide deck, which, are, which are, we're going to be distributing or else putting on the website. Um, we will have um, ongoing sort of peer learning opportunities over the next month, both leading up to um, the commitments by cities in Paris and after Paris. Um, we would like to encourage people who are going to get involved in the market to um, really be a part of a coalition in terms of offering your services peer-to-peer and offering data that you have that we can actually collect in the Climate Bonds Initiative to see what you're experiencing in the market in terms of investor feedback and other things. Um, we'll be collecting that data in an effort to try to drive liquidity in the market. Um, we also have um, a Green City Bonds webpage being launched today where the guide is attached. And we're, and we're going to be putting together some, a lot of talk about what's green, what's not green, putting together some asset class um, roundtables about what is the best thinking about what's green in different sectors and inviting um, folks to participate in those events. So if you're a city and you want to actually host one of these events um, in your city, um, please reach out to us. Um, we've done some excellent smaller regional roundtables as a, as a lead up to this event in New York. Um, it was hosted by the Comptroller earlier this year and also um, did an event in Washington, D.C. at a local law firm there. But uh, I want to thank you for participating um, and sorry for the technical difficulties. Please feel free to reach out to us any further information. Thank you, Katie, and the rest of the coalition for making this possible. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.